This video is about the A-stable multivibrator circuit. An A-stable multivibrator is a free-running oscillator that is based on two amplifiers, these transistors right here, that are cross-coupled where one amplifier provides feedback to the other amplifier, and vice versa, through resistors and capacitors, which also, the value of which, also determine the timing and the frequency of the oscillation. An A-stable multivibrator is simply a free-running oscillator. This can be compared to a monostable, which means one state, which would be, for example, if you were to find some place in the circuit that you could apply a voltage to, and you could light this red LED for say one second, it would go off, and it would revert back to its original state. So that's why they call it a one state, monostable. This can also, this A stable or free running multivibrator can also be uh, as compared to a bistable multivibrator, which for example would be if you could apply a voltage to some place in the circuit, you could light this red LED and then apply a voltage to a different part of the circuit and light the green LED, and that green LED would stay on. So a bistable would have two distinct states. Now both of those other circuits that I'm comparing this A-stable multivibrator circuit to, where you can see that in another video, is something you could easily build with 10 components. I've got a couple of general purpose transistors here, the two N3904s, four resistors, a couple of electrolytic capacitors, and some basic LEDs. It can easily be powered by power supply, which I have set to 9 volts. It could probably run on as high as 12, 13 volts, as low as 5 volts. But 9 volts is where I've got it set at and is the voltage at which I will explain how it works. Uh, but you could actually just run this on a 9-volt battery. And based on the current draw of this circuit, you could probably get on a 9-volt battery, you probably could get about 8 hours out of this circuit. By the way, if you want to build this circuit, here is a picture of the breadboard with the schematic references superimposed over it next to the components. You want to make sure you get these two transistors in the right orientation. These two jumpers there, they're kind of small, might be a little hard to see. You want to make sure you get those in there. And also, which is very important, you want to get the polarity of these capacitors correct. Here's a picture of the schematic with the references and values on it. And here's the parts list. Obviously, you're going to need a breadboard, power supply, way to power the breadboard, jumper wires, things of that nature. So you're going to need a minimum level of breadboarding equipment. At breadboardcircuits.com, there's a page that uh, has a recommendation for a minimum level of equipment that you'll want to have for breadboarding, as well as some safety tips and uh, best practices. And here are the other components that you're going to need for this circuit here. So the way the circuit works is you have two transistors here that are the same part number, yet have manufacturing differences between the two that causes one of them to conduct first. One of them is going to have a little higher gain than the other one. So one of them is going to turn on first. So once that happens, the circuit goes into this state of oscillation right here. Suppose it's been oscillating for a while. Now, suppose this transistor is in its on state. On state means that this transistor is in saturation from here to here is about zero volts. From here, to here is about 0.7 because you have the emitter to base junction, which is going to be about 0.7 volts right there. Now, so that means that you have zero volts right here and you've got zero volts on the other side of the capacitor. But what has happened was that before this became zero volts, after this transistor turned on, this side of this capacitor was actually seven volts because you have nine volts here in the power supply. You got about a two volt drop right there 
from this LED. That gives you seven volts right there. This side of the capacitor was 0.7 volts because of this base to emitter junction. So you got 0.7 volts there, 7 minus 0.7, that means you got 6.3 volts across that capacitor. That's your positive and your negative. So once this transistor turned on, it's going to, this becomes zero, and that's going to push the 6.3 volts this way towards the base of this transistor. So you're going to get, real quickly, you're going to get minus 6.3 volts right here. Um, and so what that's going to do is that's a, immediately going to turn this transistor off. So once this transistor turns off, this side will start to charge because this is zero volts. You got nine volts here and you've got that capacitor right there. Current is going to start to flow to this resistor here and it's going to charge that capacitor. That's zero volts and this is going to charge up negatively. You're going to get a negative charge on that side of the, of the capacitor. And it's going to reach 0.7 volts. Once that reaches 0.7 volts, this transistor will turn on. Once this transistor turns on, the same exact thing is going to happen to this transistor here. It's going to get minus 6.3 volts pushed to this transistor. It's going to turn this transistor off. So, and it's just going to oscillate like that forever until you turn the power off. So the frequency at which this oscillates is dependent on the RC time constant that is defined by that resistor and that capacitor, that resistor and that capacitor. Notice that the values of these resistors are the same, they're 47K. The values of these, trans of these capacitors are the same, they're 10 microfarad, which makes this a symmetrical circuit, which means we're gonna have a 50% duty cycle. You should have something like that. So in order to set the frequency for this, there's a formula to do that. So the time it takes for each transistor to turn on is based on this RC time constant. And that time defines one half of the time period because the frequency is equal one over the time period that time period. But this is one half of a time period. Each of these is one half of a time period. Each time period is the time it takes to turn each transistor on is 0.693 times R times C. All right. Now, a full time period, since this is one half of a time period, a full time period would be 1.385 times R times C. That's going to be your time period. Your frequency is going to be the reciprocal of this. So then the frequency is going to be the 1 over 1.385 is going to be 0.72 divided by RC. And when I say RC, I'm talking about these base resistors not these resistors here because these resistors just determine the current, primarily determine the current flowing through these LEDs. These base resistors, when I say base, those are the ones connected to the base of the transistors. Those are the ones that define the RC time constant for the circuit. 0.72 divided by RC, you have 0.72 divided by 47K resistor times Capacitor is 10 microfarads, so that's 10 times 10 to the minus 6. So our frequency comes out to 1.53 hertz, or 1.5 cycles per second. And that's about what we have right there. So that's how you calculate the frequency of this. So what could you use this circuit for? Well, it doesn't really, it's more of a demo circuit. It doesn't really do much more than flash a couple of LEDs. Uh, you could use it as a pre-driver for a, a higher current flasher. You could use it as a, as, as a, as a 
uh, general purpose oscillator to drive clock circuits. You could use it as a time, a, um, a timer, um, or even a pulse width modulator if you were to um, modify the circuit. One thing about this particular circuit here, because of the timing um, and the charging of this capacitor, the actual output looks something like this. As, that capac as the capacitors charge, it actually affects the output. So it looks like this. It's enough, I mean, it's plenty enough to light LEDs, which is fine, um, but it's limited in, in its applications because if you want to use this to drive uh, as a clock circuit or to drive a higher current uh, device to, um, or drive a device that ultimately drove a higher current uh, load, you're going to want a square wave. You're going to want something that turns that device on and off very, very clean. You're not going to want this right here because this is going to cause a lot of waste heat in your um, in whatever device that you're using as a driver. So there are there is a way to actually get a nice clean square wave out of this circuit here, uh, just by adding a couple of components. And uh, but that'll be in another video. There's actually a video. Um, for how to improve this and get a nice square wave. And there's also another video for how to turn this one, this circuit into a pulse width modulator, which uh, only uses four transistors. That's kind of a neat circuit there. So that's the A-stable multi-vibrator circuit, how to build it and how it works. And I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found this video helpful and informative. If you did, please like this video and subscribe to this channel. For more information about this project, as well as recommended breadboarding equipment, best practices, and safety tips, please go to breadboardcircuits.com.